So the first node that I'd like to talk about is the tile sampler node. Tile sampler node is probably the best way to create any man-made pattern inside of Substance Designer. It's a little bit more evolved version of the tile generator that used to be, or that still is in Substance Designer back when uh, Substance Designer was first getting off the ground. Um, with the tile sampler node, you actually have quite a few different inputs that can change and affect the way that the pattern is manipulated inside of designer. So you can change the position, the rotation size, color, etc., based on the kind of inputs that you plug into the tile sampler node. So to show this off, let's just uh, start by bringing in a tile sampler node. And we're going to connect this to our graph outputs just so we can see what's going on inside of 3D view. Right now we have the tessellation on and we have uh, some scale put up so you can actually see the, um, the height information affecting geo. Right now we only have a square pattern so if you actually go into the attributes inside of the pattern we can from here change it to disk paraboloid, and we have a bunch of other ones that we can start messing around with. We can mess with thorns, and you can kind of see that it's it's a pretty generic pattern. It's just, you know, uh, the same amount X and Y, so nothing too crazy. We can go in and actually change the amount uh, with the X and Y values. So we can do tens, we can do kind of an, uh, an odd number or even number of samples. So you'll notice that the pattern is actually getting stretched a little bit. And that's because Substance Designer tries to tile the pattern as best as possible. And because we've lowered the amount and it wants to keep it tiling, it needs to stretch the pattern just a tiny bit so it could keep the pattern tiling. So if we did like a three on this, you'll notice that it's getting an extreme amount of stretching. But if you were to press spacebar to see the tiling, you, you'll notice that the tiling is still there. One cool thing about the tile sampler is that you don't actually have to plug in anything if you don't want to, to get a pretty random result. So we have a bunch of different parameters that we can play with. We can change the pattern if we want to. We can change the size, the, um, the rotation, the color, and we just have a bunch of different sliders to get some pretty nice organic random results. But I would say the real power to the tile sampler node is actually being able to plug in different kinds of maps and different noises that'll give you different results that necessarily you wouldn't be able to get just by moving some sliders around. So with that, I kind of want to go over each different input and how it changes and reflects the different results you get inside of the tile sampler. So we're just going to start from the top. The first one is pattern input one. And pattern input one is really cool because you can plug in any sort of shape that wouldn't necessarily be inside of the dropdown that you would by default in the tile sampler. For example, let's just use a cool one that I think will give you some nice results is the new 3D cube that they just recently added a couple updates ago. So this is a three dimensional cube. And this, this kind of shape, you're not going to find in the dropdown of the tile sampler. So what we can do is we can plug in this into the pattern input one. We change this to pattern input and instantly we're going to see the result of whatever shape we plugged into the pattern input. It's going to start repeating and we can now start to manipulate how we were doing before with any other pattern that you can choose from the dropdown. Uh, you'll notice that it says pattern input one right here in the input node. And the reason it says number one is because we can actually bump up the number of inputs to plug in. So if we want to do, let's say a second input, let's just duplicate this cube node and let's just give it a kind of different rotation. So it looks a little bit different. So we can plug this in. And now again, you'll notice that both shapes are appearing in a pattern-like way as we have both this cube and this cube are showing up. It's being randomly distributed because of the in input distribution we have. So right now it's set to random. We can put it to pattern number and it'll do every other one. So it's doing one, two, one, two. So random was kind of giving us just a random 
uh, placement for each different input. Um, we do have some more parameters to play with, so we can change the rotation to be random. So instead of all being the same rotation, we're able to quickly change the rotation of the different patterns. We can change the symmetry random. So right now, instead of being symmetrical, we're able to change the distribution of that. So some are symmetrical, some are not. And again, the mode that the, symmet the symmetry random works is you can either do horizontal and vertical. We can just set it to horizontal. And that pretty much covers the settings you can change underneath the pattern attributes. So next up, let's talk about the sizing. I'm gonna keep these two cubes as inputs just so we can see the different um, changes that are gonna occur once we start plugging in different uh, inputs. So for the scale map input, you'll find the setting under the size. Before we plug something in, I just wanna go over that we can change the size scale of the different patterns. So right off the bat, you can kind of see like some nice rocky surface going on here. If we started adding some noise, could be kind of cool. Um, we can again do scale random and each different cube is being scaled differently. Now let's say you want to have certain cubes scaled up a certain way versus others. That's where the scale map input comes in. I'm just going to use a random noise that I like using. So one that will kind of show you guys a better representation. So let's just do a Perlin noise. Let's bring down the scale all the way down. Bring up the disorder. We're going to plug in the scale map input. And when you plug something in, you'll notice nothing happens instantly. We have to come down into the scale map multiplier. And this uh, kind of parameter actually affects how much of the map is being utilized. So I like to push it all the way to one. And you'll notice that some cubes started kind of getting smaller, some are getting really small. And that's based off of the way this map is kind of laid out with the different uh, white and black values. So uh, to show you guys, so kind of a clear like example let's just do a levels in here and let's bring these blacks up and these whites up so what's happening is with the white values it's staying pretty much the same that you would if there was no value change but any part or any um, area that you see black is it's gonna scale all the way down till nothing so if we kind of start bringing this back a little bit and we start bringing some grays you'll notice that whatever area is white is going to stay the same and the black areas and gray values are kind of going to get kind of smaller as they fade out on the map from a white to a black uh, value so let's actually go back into the tile sampler and change the input to maybe a square so we can kind of see what's going on. Let's uh, bring the let's bring the y amount back to something that's even, and let's bring the scale down a little bit. So as you can see, the any area from this map in that have black ranges, you can kind of see it if right next to each other. Any white areas are going to pretty much stay the same. Any black areas are going to start fading out. And with the gray values, that's the ones that are getting typically smaller as it goes to complete black. The cool thing about these input sliders is that we're given the ability to still edit them even more by going back into the attributes and messing with the sliders that were there originally uh, before we even in, uh, inputted anything. So we can actually go and change the scale if we want to. Uh, we do say we do like this result, but we would just want to give it a kind of a more random feel. So we're going to start getting um, some scale random that's based more so off the node itself rather than the input that's being plugged in. And we can change the effect by just doing X or the Y. So uh, you'll notice that these cubes are getting stretched either by in the Y or the X. So if we want to just change it to both, we can do X and Y, and that's how they're being scaled.
So from here, let's talk about the displacement map input. Now this input can be found underneath the position inputs, or sorry, position parameters in the properties for the tile sampler. Um, what the position does is we can actually move all these different squares in a random pattern. So let's just disconnect this scale input really quickly. And let's go back into here and bring down the scale map back to zero. We're gonna bring, we're gonna actually just zero out all the different, um, except for the regular scale. Well, actually, let's bring this down to one. And maybe a little bit less. Okay. So with the position, you'll notice that all the squares are perfectly aligned and are almost on a grid-like surface. If we start messing with the position random, you'll notice them start kind of moving off into their own kind of paths. So if we kind of start bumping it a little higher, you'll notice them uh, interpenetrating each other. So you'll get some really cool like shapes and some weird, almost like artifact looking stuff. If we bring this back down and start messing with just the offset, you'll notice that every other line is starting to shift a little bit. And this is really cool when you want to break up the kind of grid pattern that it was on before, especially when you're trying to make bricks because the way bricks are laid out, it's kind of a one brick to every two brick is laid on top of each other. Um, so that is offset. Now, if we wanted to change, say we wanted, we like this pattern, but say we wanted the top of the, the top of the bricks or the bottom of the bricks to kind of just be right on the edge. That's where global offset comes in. So if we actually start bringing down the Y, the pattern will continue to tile, but we can move the pattern on the Y or the X, depending on where we want the tiling cutoff to happen. So if we don't like the cutoff on the X, we can actually just move it slightly over and to have this brick completely there. And then when we press spacebar, you'll notice that the, pat the, uh, the tiling is still actually there. Now, let's say we want to move certain bricks a certain way and certain bricks to stay. It's kind of like what we talked about with the size, where we wanted certain things to stay and certain things to move. We can go ahead and plug in the same um, noise that we had originally for the scale map input. So if we just plug this into displacement map input, uh, as before, you won't see any change instantly. We have to go into the attributes and bump up the displacement map intensity to something like a one. And You'll notice that we start getting some movement um, and some offsets dependent on what kind of values we have inside of the um, inside of our noise. So, for example, if we just bring in a solid, let's do a solid like uniform color. Let's do just a white value. A white value isn't going to move any of these bricks at all, or any of this um, the shape that you originally chose at all. Um, but if once we start introducing some black values and some white values, that's gonna essentially tell the tile sampler which way to move these different um, shapes. So if we plug this back in, um, anything with a black is gonna be completely offset to the point where it no longer exists there, and anything with the grays are slowly moving towards the other kind of um, shapes that are nearby. So if we, let's see, let's kind of bring in let's see, let's see, black values with some grays. Let's, uh, let's get some black gray values. So right here, you can kind of see what's going on with anything that's inside of the black regions with the gray values. They Anything that would be here kind of has begun offsetting to the side, whichever side. So it can kind of disappear depending on where the black areas of the map are. So let's try another different um, noise or maybe even let's try a shape really quick to give you a better representation of what's going on. So let's get a disc and let's plug this in. And we're not gonna see anything because of the displacement map input intensity is all the way to one. So once we start kind of bringing this in, you'll notice that any area within the white, that is essentially what 
it wants to start moving away and that's why when we take it back up to one we don't have like anything moving because it's kind of already been from one side to the other so if we do like maybe at a 0.5 anything that was originally in the white is being shifted over so that it cannot be in that specific area so once we go back into the attributes again we can start playing and mess with the other offset inputs or parameters that we originally had we can start bringing in the random and because we have this input and we don't we're essentially telling it oh anything in this area uh, is going to start moving to the left or right we don't want anything in the middle that's why we're getting this kind of blank open area inside of our map so from here we can move on to the rotation map input let's actually uh, disconnect this one we're going to set our position values back to our just the default values and with rotation it's pretty self-explanatory you know we have uh we can change this little almost looks like a clock where we can change the the arm of what kind of turn and angle to be so if we're doing like a 0.39 every single one of these is going to be uh, rotated at 0.39 we set this back to zero Let's set that back to zero uh, we can do a rotation random and this just rotates every single square uh, differently so it's not all the same and again this is where we're doing the exact same kind of uh, map input so if we just plug in the shape again that we did for the displacement let's just do rotation map input uh, and then we have to go back into the parameters and look for the rotation intensity so if we bring this all the way up to let's do like uh, 0.6 you'll notice anything that's in this mask air mask region like this white area is the only thing that's being rotated so as previous with the other parameters we can start bringing in the rotation randoms we can start rotating other kind of parameters and we're going to get different results dependent on that so let's continue on i want to skip the vector map till the end because that's kind of uh important for every single one of these inputs so let's move on to the color map input for the color map input it's really cool to get some different height variation inside of your map for your um, grayscale height map so for example because all of our squares in this entire pattern in general has all white uh, bricks or squares um, you'll notice that when we look on to the side of our 3d view you'll notice that each one of these squares are on the same plane now let's say we wanted to mess with that and have different height values for each different one we can easily do that by for example bring in that purling noise that we had before and let's kind of give it a random disorder let's bring up the scale a little bit let's plug that into our color map and to find the color map uh, intensity input, uh, we can actually go down all the way to color. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring up the, I believe it's the color parameterization multiplier. So if we start bringing this up, all the values that we have in here are going to start affecting the kind of changes inside of the pattern. So you'll notice instantly that we start finally getting some nice shift in planes. So anywhere that we had white values is staying relatively the same and anywhere with dark values, it's getting lower. So if we wanna kind of get crazy with this, we can add a levels onto this. We can start bringing down the blacks and we can start bringing up the whites. So now we can, it's kind of a more drastic uh, way of seeing things. Anything that has a black is almost completely disappeared into the um, the bottom of the plane and anything with whites is going up and anything with grayscale values are kind of in the in-betweens that are kind of stepping upwards so if we go back into the tile sampler we can actually change some of the other parameters we can actually do a color random in here so if we don't say we didn't want to have this input in here and we just wanted a color random you'll notice that if we just take down the multiplier, 
and we just do a random color, it's gonna give us somewhat the same result, except with the BAP, you're actually able to give it a more almost man-made look to it because you're actually choosing where you want certain things to happen, whereas this is more random and it's kind of doing it randomly. We can change the, the luminance values of these. Um, we could change the global opacity so it's not as kind of intense dependent on whatever value you have in here. And we can change the background color as well. So right now, this background color is, you can double click, you can see it's black. We can actually bring this up to almost like a white or a grayscale. And because it's going up to this gray and it's matching some of the values that we originally um, changed because of the color random, they're kind of disappearing within the 3D and the 2D view. So that pretty much covers everything in the color map. So next up, let's talk about the mask map input. So the mask map input is pretty much um, a quick one to go over as it's self-explanatory. Um, that Those settings can actually be found underneath all the way at the bottom where the color is. So if we plug in this, this map right here, it's the same one that we were using a couple videos ago. So if we just bring this down in the mask map input, and again, you'll notice that nothing happens, but firstly, let's kind of take off all the color variation that we had. So let's bring down the color random. Let's bring back the opacity back to one, and let's just go ahead and bring the random rotation back to zero and set this back down to zero. So if we scroll down into the color settings, you're going to notice we have a slider for mass map threshold, and that pretty much coincides with the input that we have inside the mass map. So if we change this to a one, you'll notice anything inside of the white area is going to stay and anything in the black area is going to disappear. Now, the interesting thing about the mass map input and the, the one thing that kind of differs from the rest is the way it handles the different grayscale values. So if we were to plug in this kind of um, noise that has a bunch of different, it's not all entirely black or white, it has all these different grayscale values. If we plug that in, you'll notice that only the white areas are gonna show up as it treats anything besides white as a black, even these kind of grayscale values. So if we actually bring this up a little bit and we have kind of a more extreme value. We have this completely white. We have these areas kind of gray and black. You'll notice it only takes into account the areas of extreme white or the areas of extreme black. So that's why you're getting that kind of result. And if we go back in here, we can actually turn down the threshold. So if we don't want to use it completely, we can kind of start bringing in um, just a little less or a little more depending on how you want. So let's talk about the map, the pattern distribution map input. So if we, let's see, let's disconnect this really quick and let's go back in here. We'll bring down the mass map input. And at the beginning, we talked a little bit about the different distribution patterns that um, we can change the inputs to. So right now we don't have a pattern distribution just because it only works when you actually have certain inputs plugged in. So if we change this back to pattern input, you'll notice a bunch of other kind of settings pop up. So right now, everything is being distributed just randomly. So if we change this to a distribution map and we plug in this shape into the pattern distribution map input, you'll notice that anything that's in the white is going to be completely gone and anything that is in the black area will stay the same. Um, so we can actually Probably, let's see, let's actually plug in this grayscale value. So let's bring in this. Let's give, it a, let's give it a little bit something of a more interesting shape to kind of see what's really going on. So we're gonna keep that cube there for now, but let's do a disc, just a single disc. We're gonna scale it down and we're gonna plug this into the second input. So here we kind of see what's going on a little bit better. You'll notice that in the, in the input, we're getting certain areas where we have the, the newly uh, created shape, the circle, is being shown in the more white areas and anything that's 
kind of in the grayscale range or the black is going to be pattern input one. So if we actually take this and level it a little bit, we're going to be able to see kind of what's happening. So if we bring in, let's see, bring in the whites a little bit more and then bring in this a little bit more. You'll notice that based on this kind of um, pattern, we have anywhere that we have these black areas are staying to pattern input one and these white areas are essentially bringing in that new pattern. So if we actually go back into pattern input and let's do three input patterns and let's uh, take this shape, duplicate it. We're gonna bring in, let's try a bell, put it inside here. Again, in the different values that we have, we're introducing different shapes depending on all the different values that are in here. So this is a really cool way to kind of tell your texture where you want certain patterns and shapes to appear dependent on whatever your input is. Um, let's talk lastly about the background input. And again, what the background input is kind of self-explanatory. Let's just say we had, let's just take away this pattern distribution. We're gonna take this back to just a square and we're gonna go all the way down to color. And we're going to take away, going to bring this back to a black. So let's say, for example, you wanted to have a background image instead of this black kind of background. We can actually plug that into the background input. And what's going to happen is that anything that you plug into here is going to show up as a background instead of the black area. So let's just say we want a, a different grunge in here. So if we bring in scrunch one and we use as a background you'll notice that it plugs it in essentially as a background image watch out for the values in this because we have white values inside of this grunge map it's gonna essentially almost multiply with whatever values you have on your shape so what you want to do is take this grunge map and run it through a histogram range plug it in and it kind of brings down the values to almost a grayscale. So we put this in and now you'll notice that only your pattern has the highest peaks. Now let's go over the very last one that I kind of skipped over in the middle and that is the vector map input. So as we worked our way down each different input, you notice that each different input needed either a different shape. We tried out different shapes. Uh, we tried out different patterns, or sorry, different grunge maps to get different results. So each different attribute actually has a slider for the, the vector map input. So under size, we have scale vector map multiplier. We have vector map displacement. Each different one has the exact same kind of parameters that we had with the different inputs, but instead it actually corresponds to one single input, and that is a single color input. So you'll notice that grayscales will not work. We'll have this kind of red line insisting that it, uh, it's busted and it doesn't work. What you wanna do is bring in any sort of color map that you wanna use. One uh, interesting way of doing this is we can just do, let's do a random clouds, for example. Let's do clouds one. And let's convert this into a color map by taking a gradient node. We're just gonna choose a different bunch of that. We're gonna put some little tick marks in here. I'm gonna choose a, quite a few different values. So let's do purple, blue, green. And so on. So as you can see, we have quite a different color range going on here. I'm actually not liking the amount of detail that's in here. So if we go back into a Perlin noise, let's uh, bring this down, bring this up. So now we have a few kind of different ranges that's a little more easier to see. So if we plug this into the vector map input, we can essentially change all the different parameters that we had played with with all these other ones in, in the same way by inputting, or sorry, by bumping up the slider on the vector map input. But instead of having to plug it in differently on each different one, it kind of just corresponds to the same map. So you'll get the same kind of areas tre treating the same way almost. Um, for example, like if we change the scale of something in the blue area, let's say that moves a certain way, it's probably gonna change that area 
the exact same way if we did it with like a masking, for example. So one way you can see that is let's let's kind of bring this offset back. Let's bring the scale vector multiplier and then let's take away where the offsets here. Let's bring down the offsets here. So as you can see with, it looks like, I believe it is the green values are changing some of the scales. So yeah, it looks like some of the reds and the greens are changing the scale. So if we were to bring up the, let's go to the rotation on the vector map input, you'll notice it's getting treated the same way, whereas certain areas are being treated dependent on the colors they're in. And it's, you're going to almost get the same effect on these different kind of areas because it's only using one map. Whereas before you're able to plug in different grunges, different noises to get some different results in each area. So there's kind of a push and pull on this. So it's really nice because you only have to plug in one map, but you might start getting the same kind of effects and treatment on each different uh, attribute dependent on whatever um, noise you end up choosing here. So that pretty much sums up everything you could do with the tile sampler node. Next up, I'd like to talk about the flood fill node because it corresponds a lot to what I do when I'm using a tile sampler to get some kind of different results. So let's get into that real quick. 